Well, at least Bill said good morning. <laughs> it's good to see you all, and uh, just want to let you know about several things that are going on. Uh, you'll notice over here on the piano that there are gifts for our shut-ins. Um, just there are Hershey Kisses in them, and just to, they're fresh. I tested them yesterday. <laughs> so I texted Susan. She told me about it, and uh, I was here doing some things, and it's like, ooh, a Hershey Kiss. I better test those out. And she said that she did too, so we, we're quality control here. But uh, if you could take uh, these baskets and deliver them to the shut-ins, that would be great. Um, I know they would appreciate it. Um, so next, th this coming week is um, a very important week in the church calendar. On Thursday, we will celebrate, uh, well, celebrate isn't really the right word. We will have a Maundy Thursday service, and we'd love to, to have you all participate in that. It'll begin at 7 o'clock. It will be in the fellowship hall because of the way the setup is there. We want to <clears throat> have the tables kind of around the communion table, and uh, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We'll also be looking at various passages of Scripture to remind us of what happened on the night that Jesus was betrayed. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, the service is called a tenebrae service or a service of darkness or shadows. And so at each one of the readings, we're going to extinguish a candle. At the end of the service, we will leave in silence. And as I mentioned last week, I know because of who we are, it's really hard for us not to flip the lights on in the fellowship hall and get ready for a sunrise service, right? But we're not going to do that. We're going to leave in silence and in darkness. And then when we come back together on, on Easter morning, we will celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. So um, I look forward to that service. Um, we've not done that since I've been here. And uh, so uh, I hope you're able to attend. Um, and if not, I understand. But uh, um, we will be having our sunrise service at 7 a.m. here in the sanctuary with Edgemont. Um, and uh, there will be a breakfast immediately following. Uh, Mike, do you still need men to help you with breakfast? So see, uh, Mike Leonard, traditionally what we do is the men get breakfast ready while, while we are, just, just like it was women who went to the tomb first, <laughs> it's mostly women in the service because the men are, uh, at least a collection of the men are, are getting ready for the breakfast. Um, and then we will have our 1045 worship service uh, as normal. So... Um, on April 10th, the women will begin a new Bible study. There are books in the office, and there's a, a, a sign. If, if you take a book, if you could just put your name there, that would help us know how many uh, need it. Um, we will have our annual congregational meeting on April 14th as well. Um, and I think that's, I think it's all the announcements. Anything else that anybody can think of? Okay. Uh, we have a lot of prayer requests and uh, a lot of updates, so... Um, that's not a bad thing. Uh, we, I, I said when we were the elders get together and we look over the service, talk about different prayer requests, and then we pray uh, over the service, and I said we may just have a prayer hour <laughs> because there are just so many needs here in our congregation. Um, so we've been praying for Matthew Ledford, which is Delray and Madeline Nichols' grandson. Um, there have been some baby steps uh, toward improvement. Um, so there was a, a lot still unknown, but yesterday he did wake up. Um, he was panicked, so they sedated him. They want him to wake up slowly and much less panicked because of vitals and things like that. Um, he's on a ventilator, but it's in CPAP mode, so that's a good thing. And last night they were able to reduce the oxygen levels because he's breathing more naturally. Again, all of this is good from indications the swelling is beginning to go down in his brain. So we want to continue to pray for him. He's, he's in a, a challenging spot, obviously. Um, Delray and Madeline's granddaughter, who is also Matthew's sister, Ray Ann, is scheduled to be induced to deliver her baby on Tuesday. So pray for her, Ray Ann Smith. And Delray um, has developed a flare-up with arthritis, a really painful flare-up in his shoulder, so pray for him. Um, so, um, 
We want to pray for uh, Pam Wise. She had carpal tunnel surgery on Thursday, and she's in a lot of pain right now. They had planned on being here, but Ed texted this morning and said she's just really in a lot of pain from that. So pray for her healing. Um, Shirley Leak, who is a, a friend of the congregation, um, this week has undergone two surgeries um, for an infected cat bite. And so just pray for her because... They're, they're trying to help, but some of the lab results that are coming back don't really make a lot of sense to the doctors. So pray for Shirley and her healing. Um, we praise God that Kate McCaskill, Heather Graham's daughter, Heather and Bob's daughter, um, has returned home from de being deployed uh, with the Marines. Um, uh, pray for Don Haga. He has fractured his back. Um, um, I thank you all for praying for me. I am feeling much better about, I'm probably about 80, 85% uh, of lymph, lymph nodes, not lymph nodes. The lymph nodes <laughs> are, are reducing in size. They're not as painful. My energy is coming back, so that's good. I really appreciate your prayers. Um, pray for Andy White today as he preaches at Arcadia. Um, Lil Di was able to come home this week, so we thank the Lord for that. But we also want to pray for Faye Delph. And, and I know you've told me this before, Mary, but what is the connection with Faye? She's, niece. She's your, oldest your oldest brother's, brother's daughter, uh, Mary's niece. And she had had esophagus surgery in the past. And when they went in this time, there was a lot of scar tissue. So they had to do something uh, to put a feeding tube in. Is that right? In her stomach. In her stomach. So, um, so she's in, I mean, this is really rough. And so pray for Faye. And uh, we want to also lift up Ben Lawson's mom. She has cataract surgery on, is it on Tuesday, Ben? Wednesday. Wednesday. Um, and because of her other health issues, this actually becomes, um, uh, I guess, a more serious procedure. A little more challenging. A little more challenging, yes. So pray for, for Brenda Lawson. Um, and then um, we, we want to pray for the situation in Russia as there was a terrorist attack this weekend and uh, um, ISIS has claimed responsibility for the terrorist attack. And so, I mean, we just know that there's, uh, I mean, a lot of problems uh, in, in that area of the world. Whew, that's a lot. That's a lot. And uh, I, thank, I thank the Lord that we serve a God that's much bigger than all of these things and he wants to hear these things and he will do his work according to his will I would like to ask are there are there other prayer requests all right I'm going to pray in general I'm probably not going to mention every single detail here but I want to pray in general Father we thank you that you are almighty, you are sovereign, you are our creator, you have created all things by the word of your power. And all of these requests that we bring to you for healing, for this young man who is in critical care, for this young woman who's about to deliver a baby, we know that, that you hear our prayers, and that you will work according to your will. Lord, we pray for healing for those who are ill, who are struggling with infections from, from really strange accidents like cat bites, um, for those with, with fractured backs, carpal tunnel surgery, all of these different things. Lord, we know that you care about them. I pray that in all of these things that you would show us the ways that you're working and primarily show us the way that you were working in our hearts to make us more like Jesus. It's really hard to see sometimes, but by your spirit and through your word, you give us a glimpse. Lord, we do pray for the international situation uh, with, in Russia. Lord, we pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones. Uh, Lord, we ask that those who may be uh, who, may, who are in hospitals, would, that you would bring healing. Um, in so many of our requests, Lord, 
And so many of the pains that we experience in life, there are often times we don't have the words to pray. And so we know that from your word, you've told us that the Holy Spirit will intercede on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. We thank you for your love and your care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I would invite you all to stand right now. Today is Palm Sunday, the day in which Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a beast of peace instead of a beast of war. And as he was entering Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, the people shouted, Hosanna. And so our call to worship is taken from scriptures that remind us of our Lord entering Jerusalem to bring peace between us and God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in us, in it. Save us, we pray. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. I am the festival sacrifice of the Lord, up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. And all of us will say together, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's join together as we sing, O Worship the King. come before you now, O oh God, our Father, and we praise you. We thank you for doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. You made peace between us. We sinned against your holy name, and you provided the festal sacrifice the sacrifice of your own son to deal with our sin, to deal with our defiance, and to bring life by faith in him. We praise you, Father. 
We praise you, Jesus Christ, God the Son, for your willingness to pursue the cross, scorning its shame for the joy set before you. The joy of knowing that you have fulfilled the Father's will, which is to reconcile a people to himself. God, the Holy Spirit, we praise you in your leading the Son through his earthly life, by whose power you caused Jesus to rise from the grave, and that same power is at work in those who trust in him. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and ask that you would meet us here in this place and work in us what is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our confession of sin this morning is very much in line with what our Sunday school lesson was about, is our love um, for one another and, and those that we come in contact with. As we read it this morning, um, don't just read it. I want you to think about what you're saying. Even when we get through, I've, I've read it multiple times this morning. There's areas in here where I really struggle in my life, and I know that I'm not a whole lot different than the rest of you. And, and it's just, it's the way that sin affects us. So let's join together as we have our confession of sin. We confess, our Father, that we do not live up to the family name. We are more ready to resent than to forgive, more ready to manipulate than to serve, more ready to fear than to love more ready to keep our distance than to welcome, more ready to compete than to help. At the root of this behavior is mistrust. We do not love one another as we should because we do not believe that you love us as you do. Forgive us our cold unbelief and make more vivid to us the meaning and depth of your love at the cross. Show us what it cost you to give up your son, that we might become your sons and daughters. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our righteousness. Amen. Let's go before the Lord and confess our sins before him. Our assurance of forgiveness is found in Isaiah 53, 7 through 8. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we have so much to thank you for. We thank you for this privilege to, to be here this morning. And Lord, I just pray that we would never take this for granted, this time that we have. And Lord, you bless us with so very much. And as we receive these tithes and offerings this morning, we just give back just a very small portion of what you bless us with. We just pray that these Gifts will be used to, to honor you. We pray in our son's holy name. Amen. Together, let's share the Apostles' Creed together. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand. <laughs>
being to help me this morning because of, I want to, yeah. <laughs> Not that kind of help I need. <laughs> you, you, you ever now have one have of those moments with Mike? <laughs> <laughs> you ever have one of those times where you really want to remember something? So I'll put a note on my billfold so I make sure I get it as I go out, and then I put it on the refrigerator because before I get breakfast I'll see it, and then I put it on the door as I go out, and then I'll put it on my stern wheel as I leave my vehicle, and then sometimes I still forget it. But you know. <laughs> This has been one of those lessons that I think the Lord has been helping me with in is, what does your love look like? And this week, uh, last week, uh, Eddie and I was gone, so I got a chance to teach this Sunday school lesson. And guess what the lesson was about? You know, the previous time before that, Will had a message on what does our love look like. And so I've had two weeks teaching a Sunday school class to myself hope the rest of the people enjoyed it uh, and benefited and got the note. But there was, this was a statement that said, C.S. Lewis writes this, there is a burden-bearing quality to our relationship with one another that is eternal in nature and is shaped by every way we treat each other in very temporal matters. Now, I don't know what temporal means to y'all, and I don't really know what it means, but this is what it hit me at. <laughs> It means the right now. The right now. Yeah. And the right now means every time that you come in contact with somebody is a right now moment. And we'll share this with us also. There are no ordinary people. You never have talked to a mere mortal. Think about that. How are we treating those we come in contact with? whether it be your family, whether it be the people at your church, whether the people at your work, whether it be that person that you will probably never see another time in your life. What does it look like? Now, he went on to say our interactions must be marred by real and costly love. I think it means marked. Marked. Okay. Marked, marked means yeah. something very different. Yeah, marked. Okay. That was my writing. I'm sorry, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's your time. Think about that. Tell me something that's more costly than your time. It's your effort. It's yourself. So everything that we come in contact with. And then Dr. Martin Luther King had this statement. Was it on there too? Yeah. Love my enemies. We should be happy that he didn't say like your enemies. <laughs> it's almost impossible to like some people. And yet, that is the people that Jesus died for. Because we are one of those. There is nothing good, nothing in us. So rejoice. The Lord is king. And he knew what he had to do because we can't do it.
That particular song fits right in with what Mike would talk talked about in moments with Mike. It fits in with hands hitting the piano. It hits singing off key. We are poor and powerless. It's not because of our merit, our goodness, our strength that we've been made right with God. It's because of what Jesus has done for us. And not only has he made us right with God, because of his work, we can enter the throne room of our Heavenly Father knowing that he hears us. So let's pray together the words that Jesus taught us, and then we'll have a season of prayer in this pastoral prayer. And I'm going to focus today my prayer on that one petition, give us this day our daily bread. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we come to you as your children. And we thank you that you've given us free access to your throne through the sacrifice of your son. We don't deserve it. But he does. And he has given us his righteousness. Father, you have told us to bring all of our needs to you. You have promised that you would give us everything that we need. We confess that 
So often we bring our wants more than our needs. We confess also that we can be picky eaters to what you've given us. It's not quite what we want. It doesn't suit our palates. But as a good father, you give us exactly what we need when we need it. I pray, Father, that you would more and more each day make us dependent upon you. That's why you've taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. We want to have our cupboards full of bread so that we don't have to think about it. But by not thinking about what we need, we're not dependent upon you. We're dependent upon ourselves, our wisdom, our strength, our abilities. Father, you have given us everything we need in Jesus Christ. And everything else is an added bonus. Shape our perspectives so that we can be thankful for what you've given us. Jesus, in your teaching in Luke 11 of how to pray, you said something to the effect of what father would give his son a scorpion instead of an egg? And how much more will our Heavenly Father give the bread of the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Holy Spirit, we need You to work in our lives every moment of the day, and we thank You that You do, but make us more and more dependent upon Your work. Make us more and more, each morning, disciplined to pray to the Father for the Holy Spirit to do his work. And when you're doing the shaping work, that means you're chiseling off hard edges, changing wrong attitudes, correcting wrong thinking, wrong understandings, that we would submit to you in humility and let you Do the directing of our lives. Help us in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Our practice here at Walnut Hill is to pray for us as hearers of the word and for the speaker. And so, um, Frankie, can I ask you to pray for us as a people? And... uh, Bob, can I ask you to pray for me? I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 19. We're actually going to begin at verse 28 uh, today. Um, This week I was reminded, and actually I've heard my my kids say this, um, say something to the effect of, um, I have have a resting face that makes me look angry. (laughs) Do any of you have that? Like your resting face, people will say, you just look angry. Yeah, Terry's nodding. Are you saying mine is that way or that you have that or both? She's saying Mike has it. Yeah. I, I, uh, I had a, a, a chaplain in college. Uh, his name was Pastor Chuck and his resting face was a smile. Now that sounds great, but when he was having to deliver really bad news, 
he was smiling. And there was, there was a tragic event. There really was. A, a, one of my classmates, his father was murdered. And he was the class president. And so when, when Pastor Chuck was delivering the news, he was smiling because that was his resting face. We all kind of have that. Sometimes, sometimes we don't interpret people and events. We need to ask them questions. Are you angry? Why, are, why do you seem happy at this news? <laughs> Asking those questions in love. In other words, sometimes we don't understand exactly what's going on in front of us, even with the people we're interacting with, which is exactly what happened when Jesus was entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. People didn't know. I mean, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what were most of the Jews thinking? This is Jesus at least the ones shouting this, this is Jesus who's going to deliver us from Rome and usher us into our political kingdom. But they should have taken a cue. He was riding on a beast of peace, not a beast of war. And by the end of the same week, the same people who were shouting Hosanna were among the crowds shouting, crucify him, give us Barabbas. I'm going to ask you to remain seated today as we read the word, not because we're not honoring God, but because this is a sobering passage. I'd like you to hear the word of the Lord from John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Father, we pray that you would take this ministry of the word today and make it sweeter than the drippings of a honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, Many of you who have had young people have gone through the phase of hamster care. How many of you have had hamsters in your home? Many of you have. Well, I, I guess it was about eight years ago or so. Uh, Noah really wanted a hamster. He had saved up his money. He bought a hamster habitat. He bought a hamster. He named her Maple, and he took care of her. Um, Peter's nodding. You remember Maple, don't you? Yes. And uh, one of the things that was a little annoying is, you know, hamsters in the middle of the night, that's when they're active, and so they just run on their wheel. They just keep running on their wheel. And those wheels kind of wear out, and they get really loud. And so we figured out if you wrap some Teflon tape you know, on the spindle, and then put the wheel on. After time, Carl's like, yes, there we go. Yes, yes, it was trial and error, let me tell you. So wrap some Teflon tape, and I did have to replace it a few times, but it reduced the noise. We also moved Maple into a bathroom so that we could shut the door (laughs) and try to sleep. Well, Maple eventually died, and it was a sad day. A few years ago, or no, just a few months ago, I was talking with another one of our children who learned that hamsters hibernate. And sometimes you don't know if a hamster is hibernating or is deceased. Look it up. We don't know. But what strikes me is this. When loved ones die, we want it to be that they're hibernating. I mean, how many of us have had loved ones die and we just say, would you just wake up? We just want them to be asleep. Of course we do. The finality of death hurts. It affects us. And what we see in this passage from verses 28 to 42 is that Jesus experienced the finality of death for us. But what does this mean? We're going to look at three things today. The finality of death, 
the finality of Jesus' death and the finality of death for believers. We've all experienced death in some form, and we know the finality that it brings. And there's a reason for death. Death is not the way it's supposed to be. That's not how God designed his world to happen for us. He made us for eternity. He made us after his image. But in Genesis 2, we were given a warning that death would be the consequence and punishment of our defiance against God, of our sinning against Him. And we know in Genesis 2, that's exactly what happened. Adam and Eve, as our rep- excuse me, in Genesis 3, it, that Adam and Eve, as our representatives, took the forbidden fruit. It wasn't a poison apple. It wasn't probably even an apple. We don't know what the fruit was, but what we do know is this. By defying God, Sin and death were brought in to the picture. And after our banishment from the Garden of Eden, the very first recorded sin was murder, death. Now, I know that we love the pleasant part of John 3.16. Many of us have had this verse memorized since we were children, and it is precious. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not but have It's easy to skip over that phrase, should not perish. The word perish means to ruin, to destroy, to be given to destruction. That's what we brought in in our defiance and sin. We brought death, ruin, destruction. And now our reality is that we live in the valley of the shadow of death. That is the cloud. I I don't know if you've noticed. I'm sure you have. The Bradford pear petals that are just, I mean, on Friday, the wind was blowing so hard, it looked like it was snowing. And there's like this cloud of pollen in the air. I was watching a documentary, a Ken Burns documentary on the, the Great Dust Bowl. I mean, this is like what we, just watching those clouds looming on the horizon, that's what we live in every day. We know that death is there, even though we try to avoid it. And how do we deal with death's finality? We create myths to make us feel better. We say she's in a better place when we don't even know if she really does. It does know Jesus and is in a better place. I've mentioned this before. At my dad's funeral, people were saying, well, he's golfing up there with Jesus. No, he's not. That sounds really good. But that's for us to falsely believe instead of what the Scriptures say. We ignore what the Bible tells us about death and what happens at death. And why do we do this? Because we don't want to face the reality of what God has said about the finality of death. And so, we minimize what God has said. We reinvent something, or just invent something completely, a myth. But we also minimize our role in death. We're all involved in death. We're actually all involved in murdering other people. I mean, it's interesting that a lot of times I'll I'll talk with people and... uh, Um, And I'll just, you know, um, I'll use fictitious names. You. (laughs) But it's not just you. It's other people. Well, you know, I haven't murdered anyone. I'm not that. I haven't murdered anyone. We live in the valley of the shadow of death, and we are not passive agents along the way. 
Jesus taught us that hatred and contempt for our brothers and sisters is the same as murder. Because it's a heart issue. And, and remember a few months ago, I, was, I, I had done some research about contempt, and, and I found that, that the number one way to express contempt to someone, do you all remember what that was? Rolling your eyes at them. I know you're rolling your eyes at me right now. <sighs> Sometimes we roll our eyes at a joke, right? Ah, oh, it's a groaner. We're not talking about that kind of eye rolling. We're talking about when someone is telling you the truth of a situation and we just go, that's contempt. That is exhibiting hatred to others. Jesus puts that on the same level as murder. But I've not killed anyone. We all experience and participate in death, heart, soul, strength, and mind. whether it's physical, relational, emotional, on and on it goes, death impacts every area of our lives at some level. And we try to avoid it. I mean, just think about the physical level and the way we try to avoid it. Cosmetic surgeries, miracle herbs to make us feel younger, look younger. I dye my hair. But there's, a, there's something in all of us where we kind of pretend like we're going to live forever in the way we want our lives to go. But then death smacks us in the face with its finality. And we start to see at different times in our lives that unless there's divine intervention, there is no remedy for the cause of death. No matter what wishful thinking we may have that our loved ones might hopefully come back to life and enjoy this. We know that's not going to happen, but we make up these myths. I just want to make a, a little side note. It is right to grieve and mourn death. Jesus himself did. Remember John 11. He grieved and mourned. He was angry at death. As his dear friend Lazarus lay in the tomb. Now Jesus knew he was going to resurrect him from the dead. But he was no less angry that death had entered his good creation. Because it's not the way it was supposed to be. We are in a deep mess. Death carries a finality and we all know it. And we're powerless to do anything about it. And because of sin, death is our sentence. We're born in it. And without God's intervention, we have no hope. But that brings us to our second point, the finality of Jesus' death. And to help mark this out, I want to use three lines from the Apostles' Creed. Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. Jesus was crucified. We, we've been talking about this, and I mentioned in previous sermons that we would deal with the details more of the crucifixion. And I want to be very clear. I'm not reading these things and telling these things to you to be sensationalistic, okay? But it is real. Before being crucified, Jesus, according to John's gospel, there's an intimation that he was beaten twice. And the second time was the most severe. It was the scourging. And D.A. Carson writes this about scourging. He says, The victim was stripped and tied to a post and then beaten by several torturers until they were exhausted or until their commanding officer called them off. For victims who, like Jesus, were neither Roman citizens nor soldiers, the favorite instrument was a whip whose leather thongs were fitted with pieces of bone or lead or other metal. The beatings were so savage that the victims sometimes died. After the scourging, each criminal, as part of his punishment, carries his cross on his back. And this refers to the cross member, the horizontal bar. The condemned criminal 
bore it on his shoulders to the place of execution. And if you'll remember earlier in John's gospel, Jesus couldn't carry it. All the gospel writers talk about Simon of Cyrene, who helped that he was ordered to carry that cross member because Jesus was just too weak to do it. The condemned criminal bore it on his shoulders to the place of execution where the upright beam, excuse me, upright beam, was fastened to the ground. The victim was then made to lie on his back on the ground where his arms were stretched out and either tied or nailed to the cross beam. The cross beam was then hoisted up along with the victim and fastened to the vertical beam. The victim's feet were tied or nailed to the upright, to which also, which was also sometimes attached a piece of wood that served as a kind of seat that partially supported the body's weight. This was, a, this was designed to increase the agony, not relieve it. In this public place where all could see him, the soldiers crucified the criminal. In the ancient world, this most terrible of punishments is always associated with shame and horror. It was so brutal that no Roman citizen could be crucified without the sanction of the emperor. Stripped naked and beaten to pulpy weakness, the victim could hang in the hot sun for hours, even days. To breathe, it was necessary to push with his legs and pull with his arms to keep the chest cavity open and functioning. Terrible muscle spasm racked the entire body. But since collapse meant asphyxiation, the strain went on and on. This is also why the little seat prolonged life in agony. It partially supported the body's weight and therefore encouraged the victim to fight on. This is what our Lord endured. We don't want to be overly sensationalistic about this, but Roman crucifixion was barbaric. It's arguable that there are other forms of execution that are even more barbaric. But it certainly ranks within the top few. He was crucified and Jesus died. All the Gospels explain the scene. In fact, one of the authors I read this week said that if you'll notice, the gospel writers don't speak a lot about the crucifixion in detail because of the shame and horror of the event. Because they knew what happened. They knew what was involved. And everyone who would have read the gospels at that time would too. But they do record the words that Jesus uttered As he gave up his spirit. And each one of the gospel writers gives us some of those words. In John's gospel, it's simply, it is finished. And Jesus died. I'd like you to look at verse 31 now. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. To make sure that he was dead, the soldiers pierced his side and blood and water flowed down. The sure sign that he was dead. And this was foretold. 
In Psalm 34, 20, it says he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. And, and we may look at this and say, okay, wow, that's, that's, I mean, it is, it's neat that, neat isn't the right word, but just bear with me. That Jesus, that this fulfilled the prophecy in, in Psalm 34, but there was more to it than that. We sang a song, O Worship the King, and it talked about binding the festal sacrifice. The festal sacrifice would be the lamb for slaughter. The, lamb, the Passover lamb, according to Exodus 12, was to be a lamb that's without spot or blemish. And the bones of that lamb were not to be broken. It's no mistake that John is pointing to this. To let us know that Jesus is in fact our great Passover lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In this way, Jesus' death is the most unique death in history. And it's not because he suffered physically more than anyone else has. Because other people have physically suffered in ways more than what Jesus would have on the cross. And remember, Jesus was never sensationalistic. That's not how he did things. Even though he could have been, he wasn't. But make no mistake, I'm not minimizing his physical agony. But it wasn't just his physical agony that caused his death. It was the agony of taking our sins on himself. Because in that moment on the cross... He took the full wrath of God, the cup of God's wrath for our sin. It wasn't his sin. He who knew no sin, the unblemished lamb whose bones were not broken, became our sin so that we might become the righteousness of God by faith in him, the perfectly righteous, pure lamb of God. He experienced the fullness of death. And he actually died quickly. If you look in Mark's gospel, in Mark 15, it says Pilate was surprised that he should have already died. This is when the request was made to, to bury his body. He was surprised. And so it says he summoned the centurion and asked him whether he was already dead and when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Make no mistake, Roman centurions that are, were on crucifixion watch knew what death was. They knew Jesus was dead. He wasn't like a hamster hibernated. I know that's a horrible illustration, but please understand what I'm saying. There's a theory out there that he swooned, that he just, you know, his, his pulse, his heart rate was so low and that's what it was. Blood and water flowed from his side. The Roman centurions knew he was really dead. And so there was only, th only one thing left to do, for the body to be removed and for him to be buried. Jesus was buried. Nothing marks finality like the burial of our loved ones. Many of you have experienced that, probably most of you. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of aloe, myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. How does a dead Jesus bring hope? Why is it that the Apostle Paul says that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes? Because 
in the finality of Jesus' death, we find the finality of death for those who trust in him. And that brings us to our last point, the finality of death for believers. It's very clear in the scriptures that faith in Jesus' death is the necessary prerequisite to bring death to finality for us. Let me say that again. Faith in Jesus' death is the necessary prerequisite to bring death to finality for us. Notice Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus here and how they're described. Nicodemus has a limited role in John's gospel, but very important. He had come to Jesus at night in John 3. He's mentioned again a little bit later as part of the the Pharisaical council. Joseph of Arimathea had hidden his faith from the religious leaders as well. But now Nicodemus and Joseph do something amazing. They mustered, Joseph mustered the courage to go to Pilate. At potential social and religious cost. And ask for the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus too. Joining in him and burying, joining with him and burying Jesus in this newly cut tomb. That no, no one had ever, no dead body had been in before. That's going to be important when we talk about the resurrection next week. Both of them allowed their faith to be on display even though it could cost them socially and in their religious circles. We don't know if it did or not. It didn't matter. Faith is the necessary action of those who would be united to Jesus in his death for their sin. And that's why John says in the middle of this passage in verse 35, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. John wrote this about himself. He bore witness. He's giving this testimony. Why? So that you and I may believe. Why? Because faith is the necessary prerequisite to be united to Christ in his death for our sin. This is God's divine intervention for us. He's doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We cannot die for our own sin and be made right with God. If we reject Jesus, we will die in our sin, though, for eternity. And we will take the full wrath of God upon ourselves. But let me tell you why those who trust Jesus can know that Jesus' death brings finality to your death. In Hebrews 9, we read, and I just encourage you to go back and read the whole chapter. But in part of it, it says, Almost everything is purified by blood under the law. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. And then the author of Hebrews goes into to describe that the things that happened in the Old Testament were shadows, were types, if you will, of what Jesus would do. And even the sacrifices were offered repeatedly, but they couldn't really forgive sin. But then it concludes with this. He, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once for all. What Jesus did on the cross brought finality to death for those who trust in him. The cross is the good news, the great news that the angels foretold. We bring you good news of great joy. Paul in Romans 7, as he's wrestling with his sin that still remains like we do, he concludes the section, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says in Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because of this cross. Because of this death. In 
N.T. Wright wrote this. The cross is the be-all and end-all of the gospel. It is the cross that generates celebration and offers healing. It is all God's work. The cross speaks of the God who didn't send someone else to do the dirty work, but came and did it himself. The cross speaks of the God who lived in our midst and died our death. The cross speaks of the God who now entrusts us with the same vocation. Because of the cross, being a Christian or being a church does not mean claiming that we've got it all together. It means that God's got it all together. And that we are merely, as Paul says, those who are overwhelmed by his love. Believer, take heart. By Jesus Christ's death, death is dead for you. Jesus brings finality to death for those who trust in him. He is the triumphant king who brought peace between us and God. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, finds its full fruition on the cross. In Jesus, death is put to death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you. Amen. Please stand. Should I gain from his reward?
Now receive the Lord's benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now. Uh, go in his peace.